and welcome to Adventures in Neuropathology with your favorite neuropathologist, Andrea Gilbert. Today we're going to be talking about the um, uh, frozen section diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis falls into a, a, under a general category of demyelinating diseases. So for frozen section diagnosis, I don't typically say multiple sclerosis. I usually say demyelinating diseases. Um, and then that information is taken into account with a bunch of other information that ultimately leads to the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Okay, so this is part two of a multi-part series. Um, part one focused on the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis, and today we're going to be talking about the um, microscopic diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, particularly in the intraoperative consultation. So what is an intraoperative consultation? Uh, this was reviewed in a prior session, but I'll just do a very brief review. Uh, basically what happens with an intraoperative consultation is the uh, surgeon needs some help with uh, determining certain aspects of a surgery of, of, okay, I've got a tumor here, what is the tumor, um, what are the margins, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and in order to help the surgeon do his job, the pathologists are there. Um, to help in a uh, multi-disciplinary um, team. So what happens is the surgeon is doing surgery, the patient is on the table under general an anesthesia, the surgeon is operating, the surgeon takes a biopsy of the lesion or the mass and sends that biopsy of that surgical specimen to the surgical pathology laboratory where the pathologist will look at it um, and make a preliminary diagnosis and then communicate that information back to the surgeon. The, uh, what happens when that surgical specimen comes in through the door, um, again, this was covered in a, in a prior section, but just to go through it very quickly, we'll take the uh, biopsy, in, in this example, this is uh, skin, but we'll take that biopsy, uh, usually it will be uh, multiple cores, um, and we'll lay them out uh, uh, like so in this well, um, freeze it very quickly in this cryostat, and then we'll take these very thin sections um, from this frozen block of tissue that includes the, the, the tissue as well as this um, uh, frozen uh, material that we embed the tissue in. Um, the uh, tissue is cut in very, very thin sections and then laid out on a glass slide. It's thin stained and we can look at it under the microscope. Again, this specific example is in involving skin, but uh, we do the exact same thing for brain core biopsies. So this is what a brain core biopsy uh, looks like under the microscope. This is a low power view. I had to um, take two sections, uh, two pictures of it in order to get it all on one uh, screen. So we'll take a closer view at this, but basically we've taken our core pieces, a biopsy core, we've laid them out, um, so they're all at, at basically the uh, the same level, and then we've taken a, a, um, a very sharp razor blade of sorts with the microtome blade and cut through it, and now that we can see it on a glass slide, we can take a closer look. So let's take a closer look right here. If we look on higher power and at this particular uh, area of the biopsy core, we can see a, a few uh, different um, characteristics within this brain tissue. So the first thing that's most noticeable that will jump out at you is the uh, the, the um, collection of lymphocytes that are right here in the center of the screen. Notice how these lymphocytes, they're small, uh, monomorphic, uh, very uniform. The nuclei are, are very small, hyperchromatic. Um, this is not what lymphoma looks like. So this collection of uh, lymphocytes here is uh, very much consistent with non-neoplastic uh, lymphocytes that are reacting to some sort of uh, stimulus. If we take a look around, we can see that there's uh, quite a bit of gliosis here. So we can see the, um, or, or atypical astrocytes. Remember at this point in, in time, uh, I, I don't know what the definitive diagnosis is. So I'm, and I'm just evaluating this tissue and kind of taking in all the uh, details here. So we've got brain tissue, we've got some inflammation that's a little bit perivascular, we've got some atypical cells, um, and then there are also these uh, macrophages here 
Um, and we'll, we'll take a closer look there in just a minute. But I, I just want to point out how some of these astrocytes, they look uh, pretty atypical and they can be very worrisome for, for a glioma. Okay, so uh, let's continue on and, and I'll come back to that um, topic in just a moment. If we come back to our biopsy cores, we'll take another look at, a, at another location here. Um, in this location, again, we can see that there are these small, round, uniform, monomorphic hyperchromatic cells, which are lymphocytes, so we've got a little bit more inflammation. If you note here that there are some cells that kind of have this cleared out cytoplasm, uh, pretty uh, round um, uh, nucleus with this cleared out cytoplasm. These are macrophages. Now, some of you um, general surgical pathologists might say to me, oh, oh wait, I, I thought this typical appearance where you have a round uh, nucleus and a cleared out cytoplasm, that that's the look of oligodendroglial cells, and that's a typical fried egg appearance. However, remember that a fried egg appearance in oligodendroglioma is a artifact of formalin fixation. So this is not fixed tissue. This is uh, frozen tissue that has been cut um, from a frozen block. It has not been fixed in formalin. So when you see this kind of cleared out cytoplasm here, that's not the formalin fixation artifact of oligodendroglioma. Okay, so these are macrophages here. If you were to do a uh, smear prep, which I don't have here because this was an outside case, but if you were to do a smear prep where you take a tiny, tiny bit of tissue between two glass slides, smear them out, and then uh, stain them up, you'd be able to see the macrophages in much greater detail. But here they have this kind of look where the, the cytoplasm is a little bit clear and the central nucleus is kind of a round, giving it that sort of fried egg morphology that uh, that is so well known in oligodendrogliomas. However, that is a artifact of fixation. Um, so you're not going to see that in, in frozen tissue. Okay, so this brings me to my next point. When you see a lesion that is highly um, uh, rich in macrophages, you need to back away from calling it tumor, okay? So I'm going to repeat that for the pathologist because this is really important. If you see a tumor or if you see a lesion in the CNS and it's got a lot of macrophages into it, in it, you have to step back from calling it tumor. Um, now, can you have macrophages in tumor? Well, certainly you can. Anytime you have necrosis, you can have macrophages. But there is a lot of other lesions of the CNS that also have a lot of macrophages. And so the differential diagnosis for this uh, lesion so far would be demyelinating or infarction, like a stroke type situation. Um, but I get ahead of myself, so let's keep taking a look around here and see what we see. If we go back to um, our uh, overview and we take a look at a different area, this is this is this uh, tissue right here. We're going to take a look uh, here. It's a little bit higher up, a uh, little closer uh, viewpoint. On the left side of the screen, we can see there's a lot of macrophages here. Uh, these cleared out cells that kind of have that... Um, um, frozen egg look, or sorry, fried egg look where the cytoplasm is very clear and the uh, nucleus is pretty round. Um, in addition, there are these cells here. Now these are atypical astrocytes. These are reactive astrocytes. And basically what is happening is you've got this injury to the um, uh, uh, brain tissue and it's causing a lot of uh, unhappiness relatively in the astrocytes and so the astrocytes are reacting to that so you can get quite a bit of atypia uh, in lesions such as this that are not gliomas but they very much look like gliomas so again the differential for a macrophage rich lesion um, is very much going to be either demyelinating lesion or infarction. Those are going to be the two highest up in your uh, differential. Um, a little bit lower down, you'd think about infection, um, particularly if you see any granulomas or anything like that. And then way low down on the, on the differential here would be um, gliomas. And the reason for that is you can um, have these atypical astrocytes that... Um, 
um, can uh, very much look like a glioma, like uh, astrocytoma. Um, however, you really need to, to um, use a lot of caution before calling something uh, a glioma when there's so many macrophages here. So let's keep on uh, our search and taking a look here. If we go back to our overview and we take a look at this uh, section right here, um, going a little bit higher power and a little bit higher power. Again, we can see there's a lot of macrophages. In addition, there is a neuron here. Uh, so the presence of uh, various neurons within this um, brain tissue kind of lean me away from uh, saying uh, infarction and lead me towards saying uh, demyelinating. So the reason for that is that... Um, uh, neurons are very, very sensitive to hypoxic injury. Um, and oftentimes, if, you, if there's a neuron next to a stroke, it'll show uh, some sort of um, hypoxic ischemic uh, injury. Oftentimes, you'll see um, pycnosis or, or very small shrinking of the, of the nuclei of the neurons. Uh, in the vicinity of a of a infarction, and here we don't see that the the neurons are are big and plump, um, the macrophages are numerous, and the uh, astrocyte atypia is not all that um, exuberant. In addition, we don't see any necrosis at all, so the um, the uh, diagnosis of a glial neoplasm is very low, and the uh, differential for this case would be. Um, demyelinating being number one and then stroke being number two uh, uh, far further down on the differential would be maybe uh, infection and then very low would be uh, glioma so the takeaway points for this especially for those uh, general surgical pathologists out there who uh, occasionally will see brain specimens every once in a while uh, the takeaway point for this that is incredibly important is that if you see a macrophage rich lesion, you need to back away from calling it tumor. Okay, there, there's a lot of things in the central nervous system that can have macrophages. Tumor is one of them. Certainly, whenever you have necrosis, you can have macrophages. However, uh, macrophages are going to be present in, in a lot of other uh, lesions as well. Uh, demyelinating is certainly one of them. Infarction, infection are others. Those are the, the major ones, the major ones. So this is part two of a multi-part series. Um, be sure to, uh, if you haven't already, check out part one, um, which explained the pathogenesis and why there are so many macrophages as well as uh, lymphocytes. Um, if we go back to this um, picture here, these little lymphocytes here, these would be uh, marking for T cell markers, specifically CD3, um, because these are reactive lymphocytes. So be sure to um, check out part one of this series. It talks about the pathogenesis and why there's so many macrophages uh, and lymphocytes in, in multiple sclerosis, which is uh, one of several of demyelinating lesions. Be sure to uh, tune in next time um, for our next part in this multi-part series of uh, uh, covering multiple sclerosis. Um, and that completes our, our uh, description of the intraoperative and frozen section diagnosis of the histopathologic features of multiple sclerosis on, on frozen section. So be sure to check out our website at Adventures in Neuropathology. You can also catch us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Okay, thank you.